Hello lovely people, welcome to my channel. It's Hila here, Saturday Night Stitch, and thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that you're having a fantastic day wherever you are. Today's video, it's a bit of a chatty video because I am still in the middle of decluttering my incredibly large, larger than I even realized fabric stash, but I'm making gains, I'm getting there slowly. So I've got um, a finished garment to share with you, the dress that I'm wearing. I made it last year. I got loads of wear out of it. I love the dress. It's very comfortable, easy to wear. And so I'm finally got round to sharing it um, today. I've got a couple of fabrics that I'd completely forgotten existed in my stash. And I'm quite excited about them because they are just perfect for what I had been spending hours looking for uh, online. And I just general little catch up, you know, um, video. So grab your cup of teas or gin and tonics or wines or whatever it is. And let's dive into it. So the dress that I'm wearing is McColl's M7313. Oh, and I just realized I forgot to mention about the hat. Well. Our weather here in the north of England is a lovely gray, you know, like a gray kind of day with some rain on and off and it's wet, it's damp, it's moist, it's bleh. So on such days, I always think that the best thing to do is to dress up. So I'm dressed up and I'm wearing one of my vintage hats, which I picked up at an auction. And this one, the net curtain goes just below my eyes it's like that so it adds a bit of intrigue to my eyes <laughs> I think um yeah anyway I'm getting converted to these little net curtains on the face kind of thing and it's got like some little pretty pumpy pumpy thing is as far as I can date this I think this was made in the 1960s it's got a made in England tag on it and the materials Unlike some of the other hats that I've managed to find, which are from, say, the 1920s or 1930s or 1940s, those ones tend to be made in natural fibers like wool, cottons, you know, that sort of thing. But this one has got a lot of synthetic material. Even this buckrami thing, it's made out of plastic and the feathers are not real feathers, whereas some of the earlier hats that I have, have actual real feathers in them. So I think it's from the 1960s and possibly the late 1950s. But it's a lovely little number, I think. I think it adds a little je ne sais quoi. Anyway, <laughs> back to McCall's M7313. So this is a very simple beginner-friendly um, style. And around the time that I chose this, it's when I was beginning to think that I wanted to shift towards a little bit more simplicity. I've been reading, last year I was read, I started reading this uh, book by Sarah Van Bratnip, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, and it's called Simple Abundance. And it basically takes you through, it's, it's um, like a, a little passage that you read every day and the idea is to gradually get you to work towards simplifying your life and I've really got quite taken by the idea and then I realized that there were a lot of things that I would just complicate for myself so it was like I was selecting a lot of uh, designs patterns for the challenge for the intricate designs and what have you but it wasn't necessarily necessary. So at the time that I made this, I was challenging myself to focus on more simplicity. And so I saw this and I thought, well, that's, I'm going to try, I'm going to do that because I've outgrown, there's the Kichiku Lady Skater dress pattern, which I've used since about 2013. And I just sort of outgrown that particular skater dress style. Um, pattern and I wanted something that had the similar silhouette so the fit and flare silhouette but I wanted a more elegant neckline so the skater dress has got this scoop neckline that's quite oh this is falling off All right we're just going to put this aside for now so this one is kept on with a little elastic here but it's lost most of its elasticity ideally I need to be using one of my Happy and see. Look at that. Imagine being behind me in a queue. You'd have a lot of fun, wouldn't you? If 
I have that. <laughs> right, we'll just put that one over there for now. And at least my hair is in much better condition compared to last week. Okay, so where was I? Oh, yeah, so the Kichiku um, skater dress has got a, a low scoop, which was okay for me, but I always found that I struggled to wear them in autumn or winter because too much flesh was exposed. And for me, I have to be covered over. And so when I saw this Macaul's M7313, I was like, this this could work. And it's got the elasticated seam on the end. Um, you've got short sleeve that can make it look a little bit like a cap sleeve and you can make it sleeveless as well it's super easy to make comes together so quickly the skirt portion has got a little bit of well i added a little bit of gathering to it because i used um an elastic to stretch it out so that it gathered it and it can go um, on the waist and just has a little bit more volume which i think i needed because of the viscose jersey. So this viscose jersey is um, from Minerva. It's a Minerva exclusive. So Minerva have been um, moving towards creating their own fabrics and putting them on different bases. So they've got cotton satines, they've got um, jerseys, and now they've just recently done a velour, of which I have one of the velours to show you, um, being a part of the Minerva Brand Ambassador Program. And I'm quite excited about that because I'm going to make myself a two-piece lounge suit for lounging around elegantly in the autumn and in the winter. <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, this is a really great pattern. I was very, very happy with this. I selected the size based on my bust waist measurements. The hip measurement doesn't matter that much, actually, because it's a flared skirt so it creates a really nice silhouette and it's perfect for a viscose jersey like this so this pattern has got two necklines it's got the higher neckline and then it does have one which is a little bit lower but it's nowhere near as low as the kichiku lady skater dress really like this dress i always tend to wear it with a navy belt and navy um navy boots and with a navy bag I will tend to go with silver accessories because it's completely cool. There's like no warmth in this fabric at all. And it works and I like it. It's got enough color to be uplifting, especially on gray dull days like this, which we have a lot of here in England. So yeah, highly recommend this beginner's pattern, but I think that you can have so much fun with it, even if you're an intermediate or an advanced seamstress like me. So there we go so i did mention that i've got plans to make a lounge suit um, a two-piece lounge suit is going to have like some baggy 90s style tracky jogger pants and a nice baggy jumper basically cozy like i've got a blanket on me that i can wear in the evenings and what i have for that is this minerva exclusive it's like a crushed velo. I chose the brightest color that they had because in winter, I do sometimes need that. I do use a lot of the um, uh, biofeedback from bright colors. So I'll, bright, I'll paint my toenails like really bright reds and bright pinks because I need to have that color and it just lifts me up. And so when I saw this, I just thought, oh, foie. <laughs> I love it. So it's got it's it's a really lovely smooth texture. I haven't yet got a pattern that I'm gonna use for it um, for jogger pants because it's been quite a while since I've made any jogger pants for myself or even an oversized sweater. So I'll have to do some research um, to make something with it. But I still have at least another four to six weeks before I have to actually um, do do anything with this so yeah it's it's a really fabulous drape <laughs> look at that and if i have any left over my girls also want to have something like a sweater or pants or leggings that they can wear with this so it's got a bit of stretch and quite shimmery and light so that's that one over there we'll move on to some more fabric that i've picked up from my <laughs> mess of de, um, de stashing my fabric stash so it's so a very quickly uh, so most of my weekends now I'm spending 
trying any free time that I have, I'm going through the fabrics. And I can only do it during the day, during natural light, because um, that's when I can actually get a good sense of what the fabric is like. The lighting in the attic space here is so poor. You don't really get to, it's hard to see whether it's a good quality fabric or it isn't a good quality fabric, unless I've got the natural light. So I'm sort of confined to doing this stuff during the day. And um, I have to admit that last, I think it was Sunday. Yeah, on Sunday, I was going through them and I just had a moment where I was just so completely overwhelmed by just how much fabric um, there was because the tubs, I'd packed them so well with fabrics rolled up. It felt like they were TARDISes, as in there was a lot more coming out of them than I expected. And so by the end, when I'd pulled out some of the fabrics from the tubs, I had like a mountain high of fabric. And I was just thinking to myself, oh, my days, how did I let it get like this? And again, also discovering fabrics that I had completely forgotten. I had completely forgotten that they existed. So that was a bit of a sobering moment for me. So, But what I did do, because I, it's not often that I get so overwhelmed into inactivity. I tend to be somebody that can be, you know, use, you know, decision gates and be like, okay, if yes, then we go this way. But on this account, I was just a bit like, and I just had to tell myself, take a breath, go downstairs, make a cup of chamomile tea, regroup it will be fine. We'll figure this out. We'll figure this out. And so that's what I did. I went and I made myself a cup of tea and I just sat there and I was thinking, how on earth am I going to, or how on earth am I going to, to deal with this? How am I going to decide what to keep and what to um, get rid of? Because by this point, even having removed out the colors and the textures and the what have you, there was still so much fabric um, that was still there. But yeah, eventually I sort of, um, you know, centered myself and I started to realize that there were things that I was quite excited about during the process. So I was actually beginning to see some walls. Okay. I'd forgotten how big this attic space is. So I'm just going to move you around. Pardon the mess. Okay. The attic room is the catch all of all of the stuff that has got nothing, nowhere else to go in the house ends up here. Okay. As well as all of the stuff that we buy in bulk. But do you see that wall here? This is the first time I've actually seen this wall in years because it's always had those bits of fabric piled, um, stacked up. So it's quite exciting to actually have, to realize that, oh, wow, there's actually more space over there. And then on this side here, I'd forgotten how far back it goes over there. So I'm focusing on that. I'm focusing on how much more exciting it's going to be to have a bigger space, to be able to do more in this area and also to set it up as a music room for the kids because my kids, they each learn um, an instrument. And I don't know if you saw in the background there, there's um, an electronic drum kit for one of my sons and bless him. He's been so understanding. He's been putting up with all of the shifting that's going around um, in order to get that done. But ideally, I also want to move the electric piano up here and then my daughter's guitar can also come up here and they'll be able to actually um, practice and jam and do stuff in here so that it's not just sitting there with fabrics that are you know, forgotten about. And I have, even realistically speaking, there's no way I'm able to sew all of these fabrics. Even if we were to say, okay, I'm going to dump everything else that I enjoy doing and I'm just going to be sewing all the time. There is so much fabric, it would literally take me a lifetime to do that. So, you know, once I gathered myself and I started thinking about all of the positives, about all of the space that I'm feeling, um, I'm opening up and also all of the space that I am opening up in my head, you know. So when I did the first um, the first batch of things that I donated, that I took away to donate, right, there was such a wonderful feeling, which was more than the feeling of decluttering the house had been. And that's because I came to the realization that with the sewing, with each of the pieces of fabric that I had bought 
And I had an idea that, oh, I might make this into it. It was like a little part of myself had been threaded out and attached to that. And with each one, so I had all of these, all I have all of these things around, oh, this could, this, this is going to be, this is going to be that and what have you. And so it's like spreading my creative juices quite thin. And so when I, you know, when I got those out of the house, when I got the first tub out of the house, it literally felt like, you know, those little strands that are, you know, attached to my creative core, whatever you want to call it, had just been cut off. And the creative core sort of bounced up a bit because it had less weight and it was a little bit more excited. I don't know. I've got a visual in my head, but it felt quite good, even though I couldn't, I had no idea that that is how I was going to feel beforehand because there was a point at which I just wanted to give up and just be like, okay, this, you know, we'll just keep the at, we'll just keep them in the attic and then I'll do it another time. I'll do it another time. But I pushed myself through that feeling because I'd already done the rest of the house and it was like, I need to complete the whole project. I have to do the art again. And I'm glad I did because if I hadn't gone through, I wouldn't have gotten that, free, you know, that, that little glimpse into what it might be like to have a smaller stash that I can be more focused on that can inspire and in fact there was a really great comment that um one of the uh, people who watched the video made about how the stash when it becomes a burden it stops you know and it stops being an inspiration then that's not a good point to be and I think that that's the point that I was at but I don't think I necessarily realized it I was burying my head in the sand I maybe or stretch is my spirit animal who knows but it, it felt really good so I'm I'm quite excited now so it really fueled my you know once I started thinking oh, actually there's a bit more freedom for me now you know there's more space in the room it's nice to be able to see the walls of the room I'm more energized to get on with it you know to, to get it done and also, hopefully, I'm hoping at least another three, three to four weekends, um, I will, I will get um, through it, go through round by round. And so I did find some really lovely fabrics, right? So for a while now, I've been looking for some quirky um, fabrics because I haven't made my husband a quirky shirt in quite a while, and I'd totally forgotten that I've got this um, mystery food in Tokyo or mystery train in Tokyo fabric from cotton and steel i don't know if cotton and steel are still going now but um it used to be this cotton and steel company and this is made in japan and it's from their winter 2016 collection and this fabric i remember that it sold out very quickly when it came out and it was in different colorways i initially wanted it in the purple but i couldn't get my hands on the purple it just sold out completely and i have just enough to make a shirt for my husband so i'm going to be making him a shirt in this i've made him one before in the dark navy background and that shirt has had so much wear and it's still going um and so yeah this is going to be a contemporary to that shirt and then i also found some lovely wool jersey right and i remember being so gaga about this wool jersey it's a very lightweight and it's in navy Let me see it's really beautiful um and i remember at the time that i got really quite precious about this fabric and i kept on thinking mm, what should it be mm, what should it be but now i'm building up this is another topic of conversation. I'm building up a winter capsule wardrobe and I've chosen navy and black as my neutrals. So my foundation capsule is going to be in navy. So I've have, I've got navy trousers, which are in the form of my indigo denim high-waisted um, jeans, uh, Levi 721. They're high-waisted jeans and they're not um, skinny, skinny leg trousers, those ones. And I've got a jumper, 
no, not a jumper, like a top, like a nice little 1940s style uh, knitted uh, sweater top in navy. And I've got my navy roll neck top. What's missing from there is a blazer, right? I need to have some sort of a navy jacket or a navy blazer. And then I also need in my expander capsule, I need to have another navy top with a little bit of interest. So this is going to be a navy top, but I'm going to make it with some bishop sleeves instead of just a plain basic one. So it's a lot of fun. I'm actually learning about capsule wardrobes and I've decided that in order to learn a bit more about Italian style, I need to understand the basics before I even think about breaking the rules. And apparently Italian wardrobes, they have very good foundation. And so I need to work on that foundation basically. But I'm having a lot of fun with it. So when I saw this, I was like, huh, Fantastic. I don't have to go around shopping for some navy high quality fabric. I've got this one here. So that's what we have. I'm decluttering the fabric, destashing the fabric. We're making more space for some juicy creativeness things to be uh, going on. So it's, it, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And I've got another episode of Wearing Breda coming up. I've got a really fabulous October issue from over a decade ago. It's been so much fun going through the older Breda issues, particularly looking for the basic patterns um, to build up this fun, you know, these uh, foundational capsule wardrobes. It's been so much fun. But whilst I was doing that, whilst I was digging through my old collection, <laughs> I also found that I have a huge, huge stash of buttons, right? And th this is just perhaps about one fifth of how many buttons I have. And so I've been asking myself, should I go so far as to try and destash the buttons or is there a limit to how much decluttering you can actually do? I mean, how many buttons could you need? And these buttons, I picked them up at auctions, right? Because it was just like, oh, there's a bag of buttons there. And then it's like, oh, they're pretty. But there's too many buttons. But we'll see. Let me know if you've ever decluttered buttons before. And what was your what was your rationale? What was the pathway towards decluttering them? Let me know in the comments down below. And even if I should bother or should I just leave it and accept that some things, certainly some things you just can't declutter. You just have to accept that you're just going to have loads of them. Because at least with the buttons, they don't take up as much space as the fabric. Thank you so much. If you've watched until the end, you rock. You're a superstar. And so that I can get an idea of who watched until the end, if we could say feather. Yeah, that would be great. And I will see you in the comments down below. And also, I would appreciate any tips or motivation to stay the course with um, the decluttering phase. I think that even though I think 80% of the time now, I'm definitely focused on doing it. It's still the weeks part of me that's thinking, come on, just keep, keep them on, keep them on keep them all <laughs> so yeah any any motivational tips or anything like that um, would be much appreciated so i'll see you in the comments box down below and until then i wish you blue skies health and happiness until next time episode bye <laughs>